Thanks for tuning in, Jordy, and joining us tonight on the podcast. Thanks for having me, mate. Um, really excited to be on board with Prepare Like a Pro and having a chat with you tonight. Yeah, we're super excited to have you on board and be represented in, in South Australia now. And for, for all the Adelaide listeners that do want to work with Geordie, make sure to email us at infoprepareliketpro.com. But we'll dive straight into the interview, mate. Take us through where you first discovered you had a passion for strength and conditioning. Cool. Um, in sort of to keep it reasonably brief, because I know a lot of a lot of people have a, a similar path into this industry. I, as a junior, I played a lot of a lot of basketball growing up. But um, you know, I'm probably five foot eight on a good day, and so I had to work out pretty early that uh, you know improving my speed and stamina and vertical jump and all those sorts of things uh, might be able to make up for a little bit of a lack of physical stature. And then as I got older, I got to have some experience through the State Institute system here in South Australia and then later some experience in, in football that showed me that there was a potential career path for people in that strength and conditioning space. Um, and I really got some value out of that and I enjoyed that side of things. So I then pursued that by jumping into the human movement degree that was at the time at UniSA when I finished high school. Yeah. And who were some strong influences and uh, mentors, if you like, uh, early on in your career and, and even up until your career today? Yeah. Uh, look, most of my time to this stage has been at the Adelaide Footy Club and I've been really lucky to work with some great practitioners and you know excellent people here so um matt has hired me and gave me my first shot and backed me in to get started and i really appreciate you know him giving me that chance and i was able to work with nathan heaney who you may come across as the conditioning consultant on instagram these days he puts out some really cool content uh on that channel um if coaches are interested but the two that i really think of um when it comes to like my close mentors would be brad newton and jared wallace so brad these days is at gws he's over in sydney and uh while he's been the acting hpm here for the last um few months and he's the sports science coordinator and i was lucky enough to work with brad shoulder to shoulder for three years uh here in both the afl and aflw programs um and I, just the generosity with his time and experience and the way that he shared that with me was really instrumental in my development as a coach um and you know i often go back to a lot of the things that we spoke about and um stuff that he taught me and as for jared he's probably the reason i'm in this field i uh, met him or approached him one day at a local footy training out at Flagstaff Hill where my mates and I played. He just so happened to be providing some pre-season S&C expertise, uh, whether it was for a mate or for some cash, I'm not sure. But um, Jared at the time was and still probably is the poster boy for uh, the sports science degree at UniSA. And you know, I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying that. So I knew who he was and I decided I'd, I'd get in touch and um, – you know, we were together there for maybe a night a week or two nights, a fortnight or something like that for a few months. And he en en ended up opening a pathway uh, to intern at the Adelaide Footy Club for me um, and then offered me sort of or allowed me to take on the Sandful Development Squad strength and conditioning stuff pretty early on. And, you know, six years later, I still call him a, a really close friend and mentor. Yeah, so it sounds like you are pretty clear early on while doing your degree, you wanted to work in elite sport. And uh, he... Was that something that you discovered by being in, in high performance programs as an athlete? Did you work with some SNCs back then that you thought, yeah, this is something for me that I want to do? Or is it something that you discovered once you started getting some experience with, with the internship at, at Adelaide? I got to experience a little bit of strength and conditioning through the South Australian Sports Institute here through my basketball uh, when I was younger. And then when I had, you know, I, I tried a little bit of footy out at West Adelaide instead of the, the Sandful Maccas Cup um, here in Adelaide at one stage as well. And in both of those environments, I sort of came across people that I now know they were probably, you know, students or um, people early in their career, but I just looked at them as people that worked in the gym and worked within strength and conditioning for a living. And I, I thought that was just really cool. So I probably dove into the sports science degree a little bit naive, um, thinking that that was where I was going to end up. And that's what I was going to do, uh, working in elite sport and high performance sport. Um, and, you know, fortunately, fortunately for me, that worked out, um, through a little bit of a little bit of right place, right time. And a lot of, you know, hard work and getting your hands dirty. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that you 
that yeah made that connection with Jared. You're aware of um, what you know his, his connections and the work he had done, um, and then there'd be some value there to to build that network for for the SNCs listening that are in that similar headspace, and then they might be in uni but they haven't got any work experience yet. Um, how did you go about making that connection? <laughs> Like I say, there's an element of right place, right time about it. I was really fortunate that I came across him in that setting just out of the local football training. But I think what you'll find with most people in this field is that, you know, if you um, if you show a desire to get your hands dirty and learn and some curiosity and uh, you don't mind, you know, lending a hand where it's required and you, you truly show, a, you know, an interest in the craft and what's involved, most people will be pretty good at giving back to you and i know that jared certainly was that for me so it was it was as simple as a conversation to say look i'm i'm probably more interested in what you do than playing b grade footy out here this year and so i didn't mind missing a session here or there through pre-season to, to learn from him and he didn't mind somebody putting some cones out to mark the conditioning and um you know then I, like i said you show some curiosity and you show some interest and you ask the right questions and people start to give back where they can fantastic and you mentioned the passion for the, the strength side of things um and the opportunity to work in the sample so how did you um i can't imagine that would they were either paid high rock like highly paid roles how did you for the snc's listening in how did you make ends meet and um yeah tweak? yeah look I, it probably opens a, a bigger conversation like the, the last 18 months i had um sort of the full the full strength and conditioning coach early career experience. I think I things were going really well here at Adelaide had just recently taken on a more significant um, role after about sort of four or five years here. And then um, for the, you know, budding S and C's or sports science students that are listening uh, at the start of the, or yeah, sort of at the start of the COVID pandemic in April of last year, I was made redundant here at Adelaide. So um, I was, it felt like doing everything right. I'd made some really nice career progressions. And then pretty quickly I was sitting at home, unemployed, locked in the house and relying on JobKeeper. Um, but through that time, I was sort of fortunate to slowly pick up some little bits and pieces. And honestly, at that time, because like you say, it's not particularly well paid. I was relying on the JobKeeper stuff a little bit, but I slowly picked up some work at St. Peter's College, uh, a little bit of stuff at Sassy and um then most significantly for me the work at woodville west irons and it was just i needed to start making an income again obviously that's that's important but most importantly i just felt like i was getting out and still applying my trade and improving my skills and had something i had the opportunity to do in the first years of my career here at adelaide i was actually getting out and seeing some different environments i was working with school kids at st peter working with golfers and a little bit of you know, early work with cycling and hockey as a casual cover at Sassy. Um, and getting to you know, keep my hands steady in football out at Woodville West Irons, which was which was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, I feel you, mate. It was definitely a hard time. I was in the same position. Um, and you, you, yeah. you pump at that time. You, you finally get your first contract in elite sport, which, which, like you said, takes a bit of work to get there. And uh having it ripped away what wasn't easy. Um, but uh, like when we first chat on the phone, yeah. um, you could tell that you you sort of approached it the right way and uh, now you're, you're back in, in the game. So um, hats off to you, mate, for your approach. Yeah. The, we, we, on your development side of things, um, if we go back to your mentors and, and then the roles and how you went about those roles and make sure you, you, you did good work for the club and you, got, and you grew more opportunities, obviously the club obviously liked what you're doing, so you grew within the club to the point where you got to full time. Was it um, something that you did, you know, structurally? Like, did you have a monthly catch up, a coffee catch up, or was it more something that was um, non-structured and more something that you sort of just made the worked hard and yeah. Cheated? It was probably, it was probably a bit too fast paced in those first few years, to be honest. I landed at a time where the footy club was expanding with the introduction of the AFLW program, obviously. Um, and so we had a like a really a really good team that I got to experience for the first couple of years of my time here in um, at, at Adelaide in the high performance department. But they needed to they needed to expand a little bit for the AFLW stuff. So I started here and did that internship in 2016. And like I said, I was the only intern and getting my hands on everything that I possibly could. And so things moved pretty fast that year. And then 
from the start of the next year, I was made full-time with the men and had a part-time role after hours with the women as well. Um, so you'd be arriving at sort of 6.30 in the morning and leaving it, um, leaving it sort of closer to 9 o'clock at night most days. And you just kind of got it done, you know, we'd to catch up and um, informally have some um, good discussion with those guys that I mentioned before with Matt and Nathan, Brad and uh, Wally. And um, it, yeah, I just, I guess the cool thing about those guys as mentors and what they did for me that I just really appreciate is they probably threw me responsibilities and roles before they could definitively say I was ready, but it just, at that time, it just needed to get done and it allowed me to kind of have that little bit of sink or swim thing, which forced some growth. And, um, yeah, it, I think that was the biggest thing for my development was I was able to see everything that I could possibly get my hands on with the men during the day. And then after hours with the girls, somebody would need to sort of get their hands dirty and actually take on some responsibility. And I was able to do that early on, which was really yeah. good. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. Those challenges, no doubt, uh, um, help you grow and, and shape your philosophy. Um, so they're pivotal in your in your career. Um, if you were sort of talking to your younger self before you got that first crack, would there be any workshops or books or courses or um, any activities that you wish you were equipped with before getting into that full time role? Um, like I say, it was probably coming out of undergrad that that all sort of kicked off. So I probably if some of this stuff would have gone over my head initially, but some of the stuff that I've just been able to sort of pluck and take away a lot of my learning and experience so far has been peer to peer um, and experiencing a lot of the coaches that I've worked with, but I have taken a lot out of, to, um, you know, some of the ASCA conferences, for example, that they put on, there's always terrific speakers there. So if you're currently studying at uni and trying to sort of find your way in this field, you can, you know, always get your level one and get involved to make sure that you sort of try and get across to those when they're, when they're back on in person and you can sort of network and meet some really good people. Like I say, a lot of my sort of um, learning has happened peer to peer and there's some good online resources out there as well. If you know sort of who to, who to look for, I, I know that I got a lot of value in my early years out of a couple of the Altus courses that I yeah. sort of um, make sure that I picked up and, that sort of went into detail, not just on, you know, the strength stuff, which there's plenty of books about, but how to actually apply some of that strength to human movement. And obviously in their case, um, you know, speed and track speed development and that kind of thing, which you can then relate to team sport in your own context. So I would say diving on the, the ASCA stuff and trying to get yourself involved in as many of those special interest groups in your city or the conference as you can um, and have a look at some online resources that touch on things you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think you would have done if, if elite sport, you didn't have the opportunities with elite sport uh, after your degree, where would you see yourself working in? What, what would it be other elite? If it wasn't AFL, sorry, it would it be other elite sports or. Yeah, I'd say so. I think, um, Every, every S&C at some stage probably wants to work with a stopwatch sport or something where, you know, it's objectively measured and you can see, you know, what influence some of your work has. And there's, there's a desire to one day get involved in a space like that. But I think what ended up getting me into sport in the first place, and like I said before, in an alternate reality, it could have been through the video analysis work. It turned out that I'm a little bit more social and like to sort of be with the athletes or the other coaches on the gym floor. But what I really enjoy is just being part of a team. I loved it when I was playing sport as a kid and I love it as part of what I do for work now. Um, and um, yeah, I think the team sports stuff for now is sort of what I'm really interested in. And I would have potentially found a way, maybe it would have been through video analysis or something like that to sort of keep pursuing that area. Yep. Um, and, you know, that, that's sort of what I'm enjoying at the moment. Yeah. And over your career so far, what, what have been some of your highlights and your moments that you look back on and were pretty special? I just, I had a, um, a bit of a, a bit of time maybe two weeks ago to reflect after Woodville West Torrens won their second flag. So after obviously the, the COVID cuts, I ended up out at Woodville West Torrens here in the Sandful. And that was um, just an incredible blessing for me jade sheedy the senior coach out there and their footy staff maddie goldsworthy and that whole playing group was just brilliant for me for the last uh two years and 
fortunately they're a really hard working, really talented group with excellent leadership. And we were able to win a couple of premierships back to back uh, last year and this year, which was really enjoyable. And um, so, you know, out there, I obviously, like I mentioned before, coming off that really challenging sort of 18 months, so it was a bit of a pinch yourself moment sitting out there um, a couple of weeks ago on Sunday after the boys had, you know, had that really good win and we were celebrating and it was, it was the third premiership I'd been able to celebrate out on Adelaide Oval. We had the, the AFLW flag in 2019 as well, which was just awesome. And it's probably still a career highlight of mine to see the girls fill that stadium with 54,000 fans or whatever it was after, like I said, filming local footy games in 2016 out at Salisbury and Adelaide Uni at, um, to see how far they'd come and to get to enjoy that with them was really cool. Um, and obviously the first half for W flag was really special as well. Um, that first year. So those four premierships, are the things that, you know, when I probably look back one day, I'll realize how special they were and how much fun it is to be part of good teams. Yeah. And you mentioned leadership, um, for the developing footballers listening in that, um, are leaders and, and, and want to get better with their leadership. What are some strong things to to focus on? What do you see in, in these leaders that have been a part of premierships? What are common trends? Look, from a leader's perspective, um, they buy into the message that is coming from the coach and from the staff and they press upon the rest of their players the importance of all being on the same page and living up to the values because every footy club will do it these days. They'll write their values down on a wall or they'll talk about what their team behaviours are and things like that. But the leaders live it and breathe it to the point where you don't need to see it written on a wall to know what that footy club should be about. Yep. Um, and probably the other thing that I would say to you know the aspiring and the growing footballers in that space as well is if you're – at the point where you're, you're not a leader, maybe you're a young player on a team or, um, you know, you sort of knew wherever you may be, uh, buying into that and, you know, when it, when it suits you and when it doesn't and understanding that everybody's on the same path and the team success is your success and just tipping in and buying into the, you know, sort of the culture and the values of the footy club and the team that you're a part of um, goes a long way towards driving collective success. And that's, that's what everybody does it for. And if you do that, the individual stuff sort of rolls off the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. And after seeing four premierships, do you, can you get a bit of a sense in pre-season that you could be on, onto a premiership year or is it not until August where you start to think, oh, we're, we're building something here? No, you do. Because I think like the, the footy stuff, maybe, you know, maybe the footy stuff, you get the sense once you actually sort of get into the, the middle of the year. Um, but like I say, that, that buy into the direction of the footy club, the buy into the direction of your coaching staff and, um, the intensity and the intent to work and improve from everybody, from your best player to the last man on the list. That's, that's obvious pretty early on. Yep. Um, and I just think from my experience anyway, there's, there's no substitute to intensity and desire to work and improve on the field from session one of preseason and, you know, right the way through the year. And if you see that early on, um, you know, that's probably a pretty good indicator that then whether the group is talented enough, whether the, you know, the cards sort of fall in your favor, that, that remains to be seen, but at least, you know, you've got a pretty special group that's willing to put in and do the work. And if they have the opportunity, they'll give themselves a chance. Yeah. And when you're preparing a team for, for pre-season for, for, for a successful year, um, what are sort of your key pillars that you focus on um, from a performance point of view and, and even injury prevention, if that's yeah. much the same, I guess? But. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I, I guess, again, it, it changes slightly depending on context. So I'm sure this answer would be different if I was talking about my time with the AFL men's program here at Adelaide, where you've obviously got infinite resources and full-time athletes and all of those sorts of things out to Woodville West Torrens where, you know, we're sort of battling away for facilities and obviously the girls here are part-time and therefore contracted as such. And we don't have as much time as potentially you feel like you need sometimes, but for me, it just comes down to be really, really clear within your context about what is important and what you truly believe is going to be a difference maker to your performance. Um, whether that's, you know, sort of KPIs in the gym or, things you're looking for on the field and you know that might come in collaboration with your coach and the coaching staff and the things that they want to see and what's important to them 
and then targeting everything towards that and stripping away the stuff that's superfluous or sort of doesn't um, doesn't address those needs because we've all seen heaps of cool strength and conditioning programming and so many different things you want to put into your program. But particularly, I think my time with semi-elite programs um, has taught me that you just got to do the things that are really important first and foremost. And, um, you know, anything that you get to do on top of that is, I guess, gravy. So yep. for me, on-field intensity and on-field training intensity, I think is the main thing that you need to hit. And you want to see as much of your group getting as much good quality on-field training as you possibly can. And particularly in, in a field sport like footy, you know, the strength stuff. And for some guys, strength and power will be their one word and you sort of work that out and work towards that with them. But for the most part, the strength stuff is there to supplement the on-field work and there's there's no real substitute for that. Yeah, okay. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So for the footballers listening in or even developing s and Cs, um, why, why is the on-field performance and intensity the, the number one focus compared to some other things? Well, like the strength stuff, obviously um, people say that speed kills and the, your ability to sort of absorb and um, deliver contact and that kind of thing is sort of the moments that breaks the game, which I think is self-evident. I think we all know that we need to be strong and powerful in collision and contact sports, particularly like um, like football. But ultimately, for depending on the season and the competition that you're playing in, from anywhere from sort of 12 to 24 times a year, you've got to go out there and run fast, change direction, um, cover ground. And you'll hear coaches talk about it all the time, the ability to spread and cover off on defense and all those sorts of things are what makes a difference to the team and to the team's performance. And if you want to do that and you want to do that at a really, really high level for your team and then be able to back it up every week and have the resilience to back it up at that level every week, you need to train for that. You need to expose yourself to scenarios that build your resilience within those sort of high, high speed, high change of direction load, Axel and Decel, all that stuff that we sort of measure. You need to expose yourself to a lot of that through preseason to make sure that you're ready to do it week in, week out through the season. Yeah. And then what does that mean for, for this time of year? So we're in October, uh, for those listening in the podcast world, they might be listening to this in January, but we're in yep. October at the moment. What what would be some important things for, for footballers, men and women, to be doing at this time of year, preparing for well, the training? At this time of year, if you're, if you're just getting underway, so I'd imagine a lot of footballers have probably taken the last few weeks off, depending on you know how far their team went in finals, maybe you're sort of underway. But let's say you're, you're just sort of getting yourself started again. Initially, just, you know, as we always say, build your on-field loads responsibly and make sure that you sort of slowly increase the amount that you're running each session and slowly expose yourself to a little bit more high speed and change the direction. But as you get your feet under you, um, hopefully – you know, you can sort of jump onto a resource like Prepare Like a Pro and have all of this provided to you. But um, if, if you don't at this point in time, just make sure that once you've got your legs under you and you've built your loads responsibly, you're uh, changing direction with the intensity that you would at a high intensity moment of a game and that you're exposing yourself to enough sprinting that you feel like you've um, you've covered as much ground running fast as you would in a game, perhaps, perhaps even more. And put yourself in the the shoes of the worst case scenario you can think of in a game where you have to transition fast and then change direction and then do it all again uh, and try and replicate that on the field. And sometimes you've got to get a little bit creative and that's why there's, you know, there's resources like what you're providing at the moment, Jack, is to give people the tools to do those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you're exposing yourself to a lot of high speed and you put the boots on and you change direction with some intensity as well. Yep, and that will help the athletes transition back into the skills program. Um, Absolutely. Like like a lot of, um, for those listening, and it's probably happening, it generally will have a bit of a trickle effect from the top all the way through to all levels where um, at the moment there's a real focus on getting in your loads with playing the game. So as, yep. as possible, as early as possible in pre-season. So um, the, the training intensity, like you're saying, is is a lot higher when you are doing that chaotic type gameplay. Um, what, you, you've mentioned the on-field performance and how that's number one. If we move on to the gym side of things, what, what, for those that are maybe following what their brother does or they're following what their sister does because they're a bit older, um, how should a footballer 
be doing um, their weight sessions? What what are some sort of key pillars in the in the strength room? Um, that you yeah, look at. Well, so what we've just already covered is that we know that with football, you're going to be you're going to be running a lot, you're going to be running fast a lot, and you're going to be changing direction a lot. So, um, to firstly cover off on that stuff, you need to make sure you've got really strong. Uh, hips, glutes, and hamstrings, basically. So you'll notice a lot of footballers' programs and uh, sort of they've got a lot of what we call posterior chain work. So sort of everything from your your heels up to your glutes, and that includes obviously your calves and your hamstrings and everything in there. Uh, and it needs to be trained in a way that you sort of um, making sure that you're protecting yourself and preparing yourself for that sort of volume of high speed running. Uh, then what we want to do is make sure that you get really nice and strong so that you're prepared to not just tolerate that amount of change of direction, but really um, thrive in those environments and sort of use your, use your change of direction ability to break games open. So then we'll work on getting strong. You'll, you'll obviously sort of notice a lot of um, squat patterns and um, some jump and power based variations and those sorts of things. So uh, to tolerate the high speed running load, make sure you get, strong through your hamstrings and glutes and hips and then to make sure that you can sort of change direction quickly and um, break games open that way. You just want to get your strong through your lower body and core. There'll be a lot of that sort of work. Yeah, awesome. So if you're listening to this podcast and you like what Geordie's saying, you want to work with him, uh, he is a prepare like a pro coach. He's looking after Adelaide Forest. So um, if you're in Adelaide and you want some field and strength work, make sure to email us at info at preparelikeapro.com or alternatively, he is also taking on athletes. All coaches work with athletes all over the country. So if you're not in Adelaide, but you still want to work with Geordie, um, you can work with them the same. The consulting's on Zoom and the program is much the same. Um, so you're in the Zoom setting, it's not a Zoom workout, which is done in the industry. It's actually more a consultation around your lifestyle and, and what the training program looks like and, and discussing that with Geordie. So you've got that context like he's talking about and it's clear on what you're working on. But no, thanks, mate. Thanks for, for sharing that and um, you really put it together nice and clear and, and uh, easy for, for the athletes to understand, but also for developing S&Cs that may have not worked in sport before. Uh, it is pretty different to um, things you might be exposed to in a bodybuilding-based gym or a CrossFit gym. Um, integrating it with the skills program and the sport is an art form and um, I think you talked about it really well there and, and um, yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing your philosophy. We'll, we'll move into the uh, personal side of the podcast. This is a bit of a lighter part of the segment, mate, for our uh, cool. Patreon members. So the first one is what, which movie or TV series has impacted you the most and why? Yeah, it's funny that you said impacted, not, not favourite, because it used to be, it definitely used to be a favourite and it still is in my heart, but um, definitely impacted the most. I loved Coach Carter when I was growing up as a kid, yeah. you know, the Samuel L. Jackson movie about the Richmond Oilers. Yeah. Um, as a basketballer growing up, I would have watched that, you know, countless times and it probably does have something to do with what I'm doing these days because I remember as a... Uh, I don't even know how old I was, but you'd watch, you know, the montage of when Ken Carter comes in and get some training and you get all fizzed up to go out and work hard and work up a sweat and train and practice. And, um, yeah, it was probably actually a little bit of a catalyst for what I do, but also it was just a cool basketball movie and I loved it when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So you like to get G'd up and, and pumped up in the weights room and on, in the field. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, favorite inspirational quote or life motto. Um, look, I, this is a tricky one. I don't, I don't have too many, um, sort of quotes and, and mottos that I stick to. Yep. Uh, if my, if my family tuned in and they were listening, I'd tell you that I'll often say, uh, everything works out for me. And although that's a bit, you know, tongue in cheek and whatever, it's probably, it probably sort of speaks to the idea that you, you know, you want to have a positive mental attitude towards everything that you go into and whether you're sort of going through a, you know, good time or bad um you can sort of if you have a like i say a positive outlook on things it'll often sort of turn out your way yeah yeah love that optimistic <laughs> uh in your work life what makes you angry what are your what are your pet peeves these this is this is easy uh an untidy gym and that whether that's you know whether that's working with professional footballers or somebody not re-racking their weights at the local uh good life that's Terrible. That's frustrating. The other one is uh, cones not in alignment. If you're lucky enough to be working somewhere with striped grass and 
you know, well mined and maintained turf, there is no excuse for skew with cones and cones to be out of alignment. It drives me insane. Uh, and probably the last one, which is a little bit unfair because I know that I'm good at it and not everybody is, but um, unneat handwriting on a whiteboard drives me a little bit crazy too. Yeah. Oh, I drive you mad, mate. No, I don't think I ever understand <laughs> <laughs> Let alone the whiteboard. That's <laughs> I'd, ta- I'd, ta- I'd take the pen away. I'd just tell you, uh, tell me what you want me to write. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to Lee handbook for that video, mate. That's uh, good. Well, these ones are, uh, well, for in Adelaide, it'd be relatively COVID free anyway, but both these two questions are COVID free world. So what's your favorite? Okay. Spend your day off. Um, I'm reasonably social and I work a job that sort of keeps me busy on weekends and stuff like that. So honestly, if I get a chance, the favorite thing I'd like to do is spend a day with uh, my wife and my friends. I've got a really, really good group of friends and strong group of mates that I used to play footy with. And if I get the chance to do that, I'll do it whenever I can. Um, If it's just me, I'd I'd love to have a hit of golf. I've got a lot of work to do, but uh, if I get the chance to go out and play, you know, that might be the way I'd kill some time if it was, if it was just me. Um, and you know, with my wife sort of being busy working me doing what I do, we don't get too much time to spend together either. So if we had a, a day off, maybe just sitting down at a winery somewhere or something, we live in sort of the wine region here of Adelaide and, yeah. um, I love doing that kind of thing. Yep. Very nice. And then favorite holiday destination and why? Desti- so if, if it was favorite holiday uh, destination in general. I've got some core cool memories of a uh, trip to Europe, but I think if, if you could only pick one place in general to go for the rest of um, the rest of my holidays, it'd be to the snow and somewhere where I can snowboard. I'm again, similar to the golf. I'm not really good at it, but it's just something that I'm interested in that completely takes my mind off everything else. And I love doing it. Um, my wife's really good at it. So I just sort of chase her around the mountain and, you know, the, the mates that I've got that sort of do it as well. I'd, I'd love to get out sometime in a COVID free world and get up, um, you know, whether it's to sort of here in Victoria or we had some plans to go on a honeymoon and ski in Japan uh, yeah. or snowboard in Japan at some stage. And I'd love to do that uh, one day as well. Yeah. yeah, hopefully soon. Absolutely. Um, well, what's on for the rest of the year, mate? What's on the horizon for you? Uh, this year, girls pre-season from now on takes up most of my time, um, getting them ready for round one, which is hopefully hopefully very early in the new year. Uh, and also around about that same time, somewhere around round one or two, uh, my son is due, my first child with my wife is due to be born. So getting, a, getting an AFLW team prepped for um, an AFLW season and getting myself prepped for fatherhood. That's kind of what the rest of the year looks like. Yeah, massive, huge things on the horizon for you. That's exciting, mate, yeah. you and your wife. And yeah. has the... How's your partner going? How are you going with it all? That it is a significant change for you guys. Oh, if it, mate, it's easy for me. <laughs> at this stage, at this stage, it's been really easy for me. Um, but no, she's she's going really well. She's handling everything with, um, you know, the sort of grace and confidence that I've always seen in her, and she's really excited. And she seems like she's got a way better handle on what it looks like than me. Uh, yep. But that's, you know, I guess that's sort of with most things with us. Um, so no, she's, she's going really well. She's excited and we're just sort of looking forward to the next stage now, I think. Yeah. Geez. What, what an athlete the, the baby boy's going to be with a, a, uh, <laughs> daughter and, and a basketballer and uh, S and C coach. They're, they're in- yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll put a, we'll put a bit of time into it. Yeah. And, and the, the girls, they're like crows. So um, what's the feeling at the club? How's the preparation going and, and take us through. How- yeah. Oh, Excellent. Excellent. I, I've always really loved working with this group, and there's a lot of a lot of them that are still here from my first few years uh, up until 2019. And there's some you know really good new ones as well that are both talented and add a lot from a cultural and um, environment perspective, which is really nice to see. It's the AFLW is at that stage now. We're constantly getting this influx every every draft of two or three new sort of eighteen year olds that are just young and full of energy and ready to um, ready to get into an environment like this and start making their mark. And you know the group the group made the grand final and didn't get the result that they wanted at the end of last season, but they had a, a really good year and they've got the same sort of bones 
this year and excellent coaching and leadership. And um, I think everybody's just really excited to put the last six or 12 months of COVID and everything else behind us and get out there and play games and play footy. I think that's going to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. And for, for someone that's worked in the top level with both both AFL and AFLW, what are the major differences for preparing an AFLW athlete compared to an AFL athlete? Well, once I think once you establish a baseline level of um, training and training age for the sport as well as stuff in the gym, it's probably not too different. I mean, you can talk about the gender differences associated with training and the difference in the movement output from female to, to male footy. But realistically, the, the game is really similar. And like I said before, you still got to run fast a lot and change direction while you're doing it and train and prepare for that. I think what we probably found in the first few years of the AFLW is you just had this um, crazy mix of girls that had played 10 years of park footy out at Morfordville Park uh, and then the rest of your list was made up with professional sports women, Olympians from, you know, other walks of life. And it was this really eclectic mix of people with different backgrounds and experience. And that was, that was awesome. And it was what the competition needed to get off the ground. And um, what we're probably seeing now is a little bit more similar to what you would get with the men's program where you're getting girls come through it. Like I said before, 18 with the talent to end up in the competition and they get drafted having been through the pathways. Once you get them in the door, they've, they've got the skills and they, they know the game, but you've just got to sort of build resilience and the capacity that they need to compete at this level. So same as, uh, like I said, same as male football and same as football everywhere. You've got to be ready to run fast, change direction, do it a lot and do it for week after week for a whole season. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, mate. And that, it's um, awesome to hear that you're, you're working with them. Like what an asset. You've got a great understanding of semi-professional sport, but then also you've seen and been involved in the, in the AFL level. So you've probably got a good sense to know where, they, where they're going because I know the, the sport, from what I hear, is growing um, incredibly fast year after year in terms of development and professionalism. Um, and you've seen both and you get a good sense, I imagine, of how to, what's realistic. And, and like you said earlier, um, what are the sort of big key, big rocks, so to speak, to focus on and, and what are things that aren't as relevant to spend too much time on. So uh, it's exciting, mate. And like you said, they made the grand final. So you could uh, get to the, the whole five grand finals, mate. How, how... Oh, let's see. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, 25, 25 oh. at the moment. But yeah. we'll, um, we'll cross, we'll, yeah, we'll cross that, um, we'll cross that bridge in. Um, you know, six months time. There's a lot. There's a lot to happen between now and then, and I'm sure everybody is feeling just a bit, just as good about themselves at this stage all around the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we'll, we'll start to wrap it up, mate. But thank you so much for your time. Are there any sort of parting words that you want to say before I uh, do an outro for the podcast? No, just that you know, I'm ex I'm really excited to be on board. I think what you're providing here is an awesome resource for footballers um, to access and get what they need to take their game to the next level and to, um, to grow in their performance and sort of take responsibility for their own ability to improve. So if you're listening, if you come across this, if you get sent it, if you're a footballer anywhere around the country, jump on to prepare like a pro and, um, you know, utilize the resource that's here for you because it can make a massive difference in the way that you perform and play. No, I appreciate it, mate. And um, we're, we're definitely lucky to have yourself as part of the team and for anyone listening that does want to work with Geordie, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, make sure to hit us up at info at preparelikeapro.com. Uh, there's a questionnaire that we need you to fill out first, which is just a medical based, uh, goal based, and we'll get a better understanding of how you play. And then Geordie has that information to be able to individually design your program. So to get started there, just email us. Uh, our podcast listeners are definitely our favourite athletes to work with. So you'll skip the queue if you add in podcast in the subject heading. And uh, we're really looking forward to helping you on your journey. But thanks again, Geordie. Really appreciate your time, mate. Thank you very much, Jack. It's been great. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, we'll catch you on Friday where we have Pip Taylor, the sports dietitian and former professional athlete, on the podcast. Till then. <laughs>